It is very difficult to give you my, my impressions of the highlights of the visit. Because to do that would be to give some indication of a preference for one village over another. Every village had its own peculiar personality. Every village had its own character. Every village had its own spokesman, very articulate, and jealously guarding his own village boundaries. It, it was very difficult. I would say, however, that yesterday afternoon, there was a school children's rally at the Northeastern College. And I was very, I was, I was thrilled by the atmosphere. And uh, I left there with a good feeling that this country will never be lost if we continue to produce children like the children I saw in Northeastern College. George Michael Chambers was born in Port of Spain, Trinidad in the year 1928, the first in a family of three boys and two girls. He spent his early years at 12 Jackson Place with his grandmother Catherine, who was of Martinican descent. Beginning his education at Nelson Street Boys RC School, he went on to Berks College and Osmond High School. By nature, very, well, you know, he's very humble, very, very reserved, very, very private. Um, and as a child, he was always like that. You know, now George lived in Port of Spain. We lived at Arima, but he came up every weekend to Arima, you know, to spend the weekend with us. So, you know, my brothers were very much into cowboy and river and bird hunting and things. George wasn't. He was never into that. He was more into reading. Always like opera music, that type, classicals and stuff like that. So some of the boy, boy things, you know, wild things that boys would normally do, he didn't really do, you know? I knew your chambers in two capacities. One as a minister and the other as a prime minister. But in either capacity, I remember him as a no-nonsense person, very focused, uh, very demanding, and very to the point. And uh, consequently, those of us who worked closely with him, we knew that personality that we had to deal with. We knew the characteristic, and so we never, we tried our best not to fail him. George worked at Hamelsmith and Company before he embarked on his political journey. In 1956, he married Juliana Jacobs. They resided at St. Augustine with their daughter, Andrea. My fondest memories is that he had a very, very high sense of humor. And with all my brothers, I mean, they, they are clowns. So, you know, I remember, you know, very, very fun times with them although he was always the quiet one. After joining the People's National Movement in 1956, Chambers was elected to Parliament as member for St. Anne's East. This representation continued through the elections of 1971, 1976, and 1981. He held many portfolios as Minister of Finance, Public Utilities, Housing, National Security, Education, Planning, Industry, Commerce, and Agriculture. His behavior is a template for the behavior of representatives in Parliament. He, uh, he mixes easily with his constituents. He was literally at their beck and call and within cabinet and so on. Wherever there was an opportunity for any one of his constituents, he would take advantage of it and pass it on to them. As prime minister, he knew that more, that leaner times, leaner times were visiting Trinidad and Tobago, and consequently, his concern was how to adjust to that, how to adjust the mentality of the country to the fact that the land of milk and honey uh, 
was no more in a way and that difficult times were, were uh, coming along. And consequently, we had to educate the nation along those lines. So there was a question of mental adjustment to the changing, um, uh, changing fortunes. And I, I would say he did an excellent job of it. When Dr. Eric Williams suddenly died on March 29, 1981, George Michael Chambers was faced with the tremendous challenge of following in the footsteps of the first Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. However, he carved his own identity by following his own principles and standing firm in his beliefs. I more or less knew, first of all, that Mr. Chambers didn't seek to be Prime Minister. I know uh, that he was chosen after the President did what he thought was the proper consultation with various people and various institutions. And if you check your records, you'll see that within a couple of minutes of President Clark's announcement of the Prime Minister's passing and his appointment of a new Prime Minister to wit, Mr. Chambers, all the heads of all the departments of the security in Trinidad and Tobago appeared on television and uh, gave their wholehearted support. Coming on the heels of Eric Williams was a challenge. I mean, you know, it, his shoes to fill, they were big shoes. But, um, you know, I think George did what he could best you know, in his own quiet way, you know, and th there was an advantage in a sense because not having that, you know, as Trinidadians, we want this, you know, you know, have a university education, but not having that and with all the criticisms, I think he listened. He had around him a team of technocrats committed, well-informed, well-prepared, well-read, and uh, they knew what it was to survive as a small country, as a small economy in a bigger pond. And consequently, that team was his greatest support, both domestically and internationally. I can speak for the international team, because that's where we were. I, I was either ambassador or there or executive director of the Inter-American Development Bank, and uh, we interface both at the IDB level, the World Bank level, and the IMF level. And indeed, the, the, the presence of Trinidad and Tobago in all three institutions far outweighed its size. I know that he was up to the task. It's a new situation, and he was able to deal with it comfortably. My view is that almost any issue that arose or could conceivably arise during the tenure of a prime minister, he had to deal with both the positives and the negatives. And I think he dealt with them satisfactorily, adequately, and in a manner that did not force Trinidad and Tobago to have to bend its head in shame because of any problem that was not appropriately addressed. Well, he studied the economy. He studied the economy and consequently restored to the international investors a sense of investor confidence. Because as you know, if there is no political stability in any country, in any economy, the likelihood of attracting foreign investment would be a little bit remote. So that indeed, he portrays Trinidad and Tobago as a friendly investment destination. And naturally, that was observed by all parties. And indeed, the spirit of investment that came into the country during that time that contributed to the recovery of the economy is, is, uh, is self-evident. He may best be remembered as the man who coined the term fet over, back to work. 
urging a self-indulgent Trinidad and Tobago oil boom population to buckle down to reality. We went through some big boom years. You know, money was no problem. So we were spending freely and, you know, we had the lavish life. But then you came down to this drop in the economy with the oil price. So people had to know that they had to adjust. You know, and I think that this is what his message really was. He set about, as far as I'm concerned, in regulating the operations in the financial sector of the government. And I think with the difficulties he had at that time, he really succeeded beyond all expectations. Uh, indeed, we saw that following that statement, the stabilization of the economy was priority. The stabilization of the economy because you wanted to attract your foreign investors. You, the domestic investment or internal investment could not by itself propel an economy. You had to attract investors. And consequently, the regimes for the prospecting of oil and gas had to be visited and revisited with a view to improving where they might have been shortfalls. And so that was one of the vehicles that, they, that he used to attract foreign investment to Trinidad and Tobago. The uh, regularization of uh, certain processes and, 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 and procedures in respect of the energy sector as a whole. Carrying out his duties with a sense of quiet dignity, George Michael Chambers remained true to himself. While he may not have been very, very, um, as an adult, very, very religious, George was spiritual. And uh, I think he really, really cared. I mean, and this is something, unfortunately, Trinidadians never appreciated. George cared about the country. George cared about the people. There was a problem in Grenada during his tenure. And he uh, acted in a manner that demonstrated to me many things. His refusal where possible not to allow Trinidad and Tobago to be pushed into a negative position when this issue arose. The non-intervention on the part of <laughs> Prime Minister Simmers of Trinidad and Tobago and his government was a decision of the cabinet. And in fact, it was a decision of CARICOM. The Cari that meeting was held here in Port of Spain. And indeed, I remember very distinctly um, meeting with the, with the prime minister on that, um, on that event at the Hilton. And indeed, CARICOM had taken the decision that it was a matter internal to the Caribbean region. And consequently, he would have been setting a bad precedent if there was foreign intervention, especially foreign intervention, without the active participation alongside of the Caribbean region. What happened there was, it turned out that two of the CARICOM governments had other ideas. And indeed, while the decision was taken that there should be no intervention, a, a beachhead was being promoted within the, the a CARICOM member to launch an attack on Grenada. Having to take up the mantle of leading an independent republic in a time of significant economic change, both locally and internationally, George Michael Chambers served Trinidad and Tobago with dedication and love up to November 4th, 1997, when he passed away at the age of 69. Well, most people in Trinidad and Tobago would remember him for his simple manner or style of dressing. Uh, but that was not all. Uh, as Minister of Finance and Governor for Trinidad and Tobago, and indeed the Caribbean in some instances, of most of the big international organizations like the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the International Monetary Fund, we saw the then George Chambers as always the epitome of sartorial elegance. He would, he would match his 
tie with his shirt and his shoes and that sort of thing so he showed well he presented very well he was not the shirt jack man internationally people did not know him he was not in the limelight but i think he was a very sincere person given the chance given you know a better economy you know he would have done a lot because there was a genuine love for the country, for his people. George, George was born in Jackson Place, right? And I mean, it is not nothing that he ever hid. You know, he would go to a meeting in Jackson Place and say, I am home, you know. And it was a genuine love for the grassroots right up, you know. And I think that people did not really realize that. Cool and quiet man. Very humble, very reserved, very private, always a gentleman. Mm -hmm.